Thanks for joining us here at Faith Online. We hope that you're both challenged and encouraged by today's message. And if you'd like to learn more about who we are as a church and how you can stay connected, head over to faithisher.org right after this video. So far, a good, uh, yeah, you're only into it two days. Yeah, we could clap. Great so far. And we're glad you started your year out in church. Great to have you today. Make it a regular habit every week. You know, it's, uh, it, church is great. It's fun to get together and worship with the saints and, and grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to take your Bibles out and turn to Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk 3, verses 1 and 2. This month, we're going to be looking the whole month at revival. How many are ready for just see God move in a mighty way? You're ready for anything. You're just kind of wide open. God, whatever you want to do in my life, wherever you want to take me, whatever you want to show me, I am ready, I'm here. And so we will be looking at that. And I want to read this from the New King James Version today because I think it just reads so much better. It says, a prayer of Habakkuk. Let's stand together as we read God's word and then we'll pray. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet of Shigonoth. O oh Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O oh Lord, revive. Everybody say revive. revive. O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Revive your work in the midst of the years. Father, today we come to you. We know that without you we can do nothing. I pray, mighty God, you'll minister in this place today that you will have your way, that 2016 will be a breakthrough year in the lives of your people here. I thank you for what you're going to do in this service, what you've already done, for the way you've spoken to us. And I pray, God, you'll speak once again through your word this morning, and we give you the praise and the honor and glory. Amen. Tell, turn to someone, tell them they look good in 2016, and then you may be seated. Have you ever looked at the skies and, and, and you could see the dark clouds just kind of rolling in? And you know the storm's coming. You know it's on its way in and it's coming and it's going to be a really intense one and it gets black and the rumblings. Uh, we, we have, I have a back porch with a window on it and when the storm, uh, we, we sit at night, you just sit on the couch when there's a big storm and you can see the lightning cracking all over. It's better than any TV show you'll ever see. The lightning's coming, the storm's cracking and it's just cool to watch that come on in and see what is going to take place. And, and sometimes you see the clouds so dark, so black, the storm has been predicted. Uh, uh, there's been weather reports of a tornado on the horizon or a hurricane's coming or something's going to hit Charleston. And, and everybody braces because you never know what that storm's going to bring with it, what it's going to contain, the havoc it's going to create. And yet I think in our own lives, there are storms that are greater than the atmospheric disturbances we see on the horizon. And they hit us, and they come out of nowhere. They come when we least expect it, when we're not ready for it, and, and those storm clouds begin to roll in, and they grip us with fear, and they attack in all kinds of different ways. Storms attack our physical bodies. And you hear a doctor come and say, you know what, I'm sorry, there's no more we can do for you. Storms come and they attack marriages and families and, and, and you begin to think that, uh, that, that you, someone decides I no longer love the person I made my vow to, uh, the one that was gonna be the love of my entire life, now that love is gone, all the love has ebbed away and gone away and out of nowhere you're faced with a divorce or divorce papers and that storm comes and it just rocks the entire family. They strike at our illusion of control as we feel powerless. 
when we see a child turn away from us and rebel against God and walk out of the house and the child goes off into anger and gets mixed up in drugs and alcohol and all kinds of other substance abuses and we feel like, what can I do with my kid? He's not going to school anymore. I can't do anything with him. And so we, we, the storm blows in and affects our teenagers, our young people. Storm strikes that uh, affects our security. You worked at a job for 15 years and now the company says we've got to downsize and you're part of the fat that's going to be let go. You're part of the fat that's going to be cut out and we don't need you anymore here at this plant. And all of a sudden you're out of work for the first time in years and, and that storm rolls in and how can I pay my bills and how will I make it and how will I survive? And all those storms kind of come crashing in on us at some time or another. Now, the danger in these times of storms is we can begin to question God. It's okay, God can handle it, God can take our questions, but, but sometimes our questions lead to the wrong conclusions. We say, God hasn't heard my prayer. I've been crying out to God, I've cried for healing, I've cried for the resolution of my marriage, I've been crying out for my kids and nothing happens and nothing going on. God, you must not be able to hear me up there. Or worse yet, if God does hear, then we must assume that God really doesn't care or I still wouldn't be in my pain and my suffering and the storm I'm going through right now at this time in my life. And we believe that maybe we're all alone in this cruel world. And we we forget about the God of history who's promised to care for his people. And we begin to think he may care for everybody else, but he doesn't really care for me. It leads us to believe we're all alone in this cruel world. Now I say all that because the prophet Habakkuk was a interesting prophet to say the least. He knew the turmoil and twist of the spirit that were coming his way and what was gonna take place and he he saw the impending storm coming on the nation of Israel. He looked up, he saw the skies were dark, the Assyrians were about to come in, uh, they were about to pillage the land and the country and destroy all that there was and so he had some very serious questions for God. And he says, God, do you even see what's happening? Do you know what's going on? Now, let me give you a background very quickly. The Jews of Habakkuk's day had, had backslidden. They were away from God. They were idol- they turned them back into idolatry. They were rebellious. They were not keeping the commandments, the Sabbaths, uh, all this. They had, were in a very backslidden, wicked state. They had been ruled by a number of wicked kings uh, in the succession there. And, and so what happens is they're asking God to intervene, uh, but nothing seems to take place. Nothing seems to happen. The Judah only seems to be getting worse and worse and worse. Now take it up, to look if you would at Habakkuk chapter 1, look at verses 2 to 4, and you begin to see Habakkuk cry out. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. You've been there. How long, God, do I cry for help? But you do not listen. Or cry out to you violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate the wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Now, he's crying out, God, you're not listening to me. Israel is getting worse and worse and worse. There's violence in our lands. Uh, There's injustice. There's all these things going wrong. Uh, And I look around and I see what's happening on the horizon. And the answer that he got was not the answer Habakkuk expected. He says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to send the Babylonians. They're going to come into Judah. They're going to take them into captivity and they are gonna discipline Israel. Now that's not the answer Habakkuk was looking for. The problem is simply this. The Babylonians, as bad as the Jews were in their backslidden state, were not near as bad as the Babylonians. Now pick it up, if you would, with verse number six. He says there, I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people, to sweep, who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. In other words, uh, I'm going to use the Babylonians. They're ruthless. They're impetuous. They're idol worshipers. They're going to come in, and they're going to live in your houses. They're going to live in houses not your own. 
they're coming to take you over. Now, this creates a bigger problem in the mind of Habakkuk, who says, how can a God who is good and just, who hates evil, send his people, uh, send against his people a nation that builds their own idols? You know, at least Israel, to some extent, is still worshiping Jehovah God. They still have the one true God. How are you going to send an idol-worshiping nation, like the Babylonians, to come in and take us over and discipline us? And then in chapter 2, God begins to give Habakkuk the answer to this dilemma. And he simply uses this, and let me just take you to verse number 4. He says, the righteous person will live by faith. The righteous person will live by faith. You may not understand what is happening. You may not see the end result right now. But if you are righteous, you will hang on to God and you will live by faith even in the midst of the storm. You will believe in God. You will trust in the sovereignty of God that God can use whoever he wants to accomplish his purposes. God will get his work done. And God can use anybody, anytime, anyhow to accomplish the purposes of Almighty God. And so he says, the righteous, the just, and in the New Testament he'll translate that word, the just shall live by faith. By faith. And then he goes on in chapters 2 and he says, and by the way, don't worry about the Babylonians, I'll take care of them. I'll deal with them for their idolatry and I'll deal with them for their sin and their wickedness and I will crush them because of their pride. And he says that in the rest of chapter two. Which takes us then to my text in chapter three. And he opens up chapter three with a prayer for revival. He says, oh God, revive thy work. In the midst of wrath, God, you bring mercy. God, when the judgment is gonna come, you can still send revival on the nation of Israel. Even in the midst of the dark clouds, uh, even in the midst of the storm clouds that are coming in, even though the Assyrians are going to invade, uh, even though everything we see in our land uh, says that the country is going to hell in a handbasket, God, you are able to revive thy work in the midst of years. Uh, I want to tell you, we look at America and we think uh, the morality and what's going on in our schools and what's going on in our government and what's going on in our land, uh, and we see no end in sight, uh, and we, we can cry out though like Habakkuk, oh God, revive thy work in the midst of America, in the midst of these years. God in wrath, remember mercy. God, you can send a revival. Now listen, some people will say, well listen, why even talk about revival? Isn't revival a sovereign move of God? Yes, revival is a sovereign move of God. But if it was a move of God at his own whim, God can only bring revival. God can only bring refreshing. God can only revive us again. Why would Habakkuk pray for it if it was strictly done at the whim of God? God tells us to pray. God tells us to seek his face. God tells us to humble himself. If my people who are called by my name uh, will humble themselves, will turn from their wicked ways, will seek my face, then I will cleanse their land. Uh, yes, revival can only be brought about by God. Uh, but you see Habakkuk saying, God, revive thy work. Uh, Almighty God, send revival. And I, I want us to be so audacious to believe uh, that if we begin to cry out to God, he can send revival right here at Faith Assembly of God, uh, right here in my family, uh, right here in our community, uh, right here in my neighborhood. Uh, if Habakkuk could pray that way, so can I. Oh God, revive thy work in the midst of all the years. The impending storm clouds have already struck America. Storm clouds have been brewing over this land. We need to understand that as we pray, revival is not for the lost. Revival is for the believer. You can't revive something that has no spiritual life whatsoever. You can't revive something that is dead. The Bible says that without God, without Christ, we are dead in trespasses and sin. Revival is for that person who there is still a spark of spiritual life in their heart somewhere, somehow. 
Some of you guys went away for Christmas time, and, and uh, every time we leave the house for a period of time, we come back, we go, she immediately goes to the back porch because all the plants are drooping. They are all hanging down. And what does she do? The first thing, she walks through that house, she goes and gets that pitcher of water and begins to fill up all the, all the plants that begin to dry out for that week while we were gone. And the next day we come back and boom, all the plants are standing up again. They've all been revived because there was a little semblance of life inside of that plant. Uh, when it received the water, it sprung to life again. You've sat around a fire before, and that fire has all burned down until only embers are left in that fire. But as long as there's a spark, as long as there's an ember, you can throw on the wood. And you begin to throw on the wood, you throw on the kindling, and pretty soon that fire begins to blaze up all over again. And so what am I saying today? I'm saying, oh God, send the fire again. Uh, oh God, send your rain down from heaven. Uh, shower blessings upon us, God. Uh, we need you, we need a move of God. And God will revive that which is, has somewhat semblance of life in it. Revival is for God's people, the church, and then the church, when it is revived, can begin to change the world. And lost will be saved, and lost will come to God, and people's hearts will be turned towards him, and our nation can begin to change. But revival has always got to start in the church. It's got to start with us. And these next four weeks, we are going to study revival and believe that in 2016, God wants to move sovereignly right here at Faith Assembly of God in Somerville, South Carolina. Now, it begs a couple of questions, and the first is simply this. Why is there a need for revival? Why is there the need for revival? Well, I would tell you this. I think we over become spiritually sluggish over time. There are, there are so many distractions vying for our attention today. So many things that crowd in on us that divert us away from keeping our eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that over time we can become spiritually sluggish. He describes a church in Revelation chapter 3. He says, you are neither hot nor cold. I would that you were one or the other, but because you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. That church said, we are rich and we have need of nothing. Uh, we are prosperous. God has blessed us. We've got all the gold. Uh, we've got the houses. We've got everything we could want in this life. Uh, every comfort imaginable, we've got it today. Uh, but he says, I have this against you. Uh, you are lukewarm. And if we're not careful over time, we become spiritually sluggish and, and spiritually lukewarm to the things of God. You look back to the history of Israel. As you watch, Israel went through all these cycles over and over and over again. They were the people of God. They were God's chosen people. And they would have these times of revival. And Israel would all turn back to God. And they would all rejoice in the Lord. And they would love him and be close to him. But then they go through this cycle, and after that revival, there would be a short time before there would be many counteracting influences that would come to bear upon them. They begin to decline spiritually. They would begin to turn away from God. They would begin to forget the Lord, forget to tithe, forget the Sabbath. They would turn their back on God. They would fail to keep the laws of God. They would begin to decline spiritually. And then God would send a prophet like Habakkuk and he would begin to speak up and he would be that voice crying out in the wilderness or, or they would get together and they would read the law and they would hear the law of God being read once again in their midst and they would begin to cry and weep and say, God, we have sinned against you and they would turn to the Lord again. Or God sometimes would send discipline upon that land. And in this case, he would eventually send the Babylonians who would come in and discipline Israel so that Israel might turn back to God. And then in their desperation under the discipline, they would cry out to God once again, and they would be revived once again, and they would turn back to him. And then that cycle would start all over again, and those counteracting influences would come against them, and they would be swept away in this tidal wave of luxury, in this tidal wave of idolatry, in this tidal wave of pride, and it would come in and close on them all over again. 
Today there is a downward pull that is ever against the church. We are not the most popular people on the face of the earth anymore. There are many in America that still love their idols. May not be little stone statues they set up in a punja somewhere and they bow down to that every day, but our idols of money, our idols of mammon, our idols of entertainment, our idols, we love our idols. We get spiritually sluggish and that influence comes in. There are many who have been put off repenting and turning back to God. And yes, I'll come to church on Sunday. And yes, I'll do my spiritual thing. But God, I want to keep this for myself. And I want to keep this for myself. And I want to hang on to these sins and that sin and whatever else we dabble into. We've secured our favorite worldly interest. And it's come between us and the Lord. And it's the reason that we've got to cry out like Habakkuk, Oh Lord, revive thy work. God, I need you. God, revive my spirit again. Help me, Lord. The church needs to be awakened out of its slumber. That's why we need revival. The second question I want to answer today is what is revival? What is it? Well, let me just give you a quick definition, then I want to show you some characteristics of revival this morning. The the quick definition is simply this. It's a renewal of that first love again. You know, uh, he wrote to the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, and he says, I have this against you. You have left your first love. And so when we are revived spiritually, it kind of rekindles that first love again for the Lord Jesus Christ. We put him in his right place in our lives. It's, it's results in the awakening and conversion of sinners to God because when the church is refreshed and, and when we are different than the rest of the world and people who are hurting and broken see our lives and we are so bold with our witness and our testimony, many sinners will be converted and come to God. It assumes that the church is in a backslidden state and a revival consists of return of the church from their backslidings back to God. Revival. I want to give you five characteristics. Jot these down real quickly if you would. Number one, revival always includes the conviction of sin on the part of the church. Revival includes the conviction of sin on the part of the church. It includes this deep searching. God, try me and search me. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 139. Psalm 139, it includes uh, the deep searching of our heart and spirit to see what's in there that's keeping me from being closer to the Lord. It's keeping me from my relationship with God as it ought to be. And and what happens is when God reveals that sin, uh, then it can be broken up, brought to the surface and confessed. Uh, It can be dealt with. And then that barrier between God and me is, is gone. And I can once again draw close to him. Listen to Psalm 139. Verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Revival always starts with a deep searching of our heart. And we cry out like David, search me, O God, know my thoughts, make sure there's no wicked way inside of me. And so he begins to do that that work of cleansing, that work of purifying, that work of, of drawing us back to God. In a true revival, Christians are always brought under conviction of the Holy Spirit and they begin to search their own hearts and lives. Number two, backslidden Christians will be brought to repentance. And revival is nothing else than a new beginning of obedience to God. It's a new start of obedience to God. Backslidden Christians will be brought to repentance. The first step of deep repentance is breaking down of the heart and humbling ourselves before God and forsaking our sins. Unless we forsake our sins, there will be no revival. And so first, God begins by searching our heart. When those sins are brought to the surface, we confess those sins. Uh, We say, Lord, I have sinned against thee, and thee only have I sinned against. Uh, And then we set our course on, Lord, I will not do that again. Not praying to the altar and saying, God, forgive me for this, and then going back and doing what we've been doing 
all the time. It's repentance involves a turnaround, a change, a 180 degree turn. You're going in one direction and the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you and you turn and you head back towards God. It's revival. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. Look, if you would, at verse number 1. Now, keep in mind, Nehemiah is a book about rebuilding the walls. There's a lot of imagery about revival in the book of Nehemiah. They've rebuilt the walls in 52 days. The whole nation is going to celebrate. But they did something. They found the reading of the law. They found the law of God. and They, they got all the people together by one of the gates, and they begin to read this law. Uh, look at chapter 8, verse 6. And Ezra praised the Lord, and the great, uh, all the people stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, amen, amen. And then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So you see this conviction on the heart. They're worshiping God. They put their face on the ground. And Nehemiah begins to read the law. Look down at chapter 9 and verse number 1. And on the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together fasting. We'll talk about fasting in just a moment. We as a church body are about to enter into a fast. It gets us in that place where I can hear God clearly. All the distractions are gone. All the worldly appetites are no longer satisfied. I turn my attention to God. Look at that. The Israelites gathered together fasting, wearing sackcloth, having dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all the foreigners. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the wickedness of their fathers. Now look, they, 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 some of them had gotten in wrongful marriages. They separated from those, those relationships they were forming with the nations around them. They began to cry out to God. They confessed their sins and the wickedness of their fathers. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law, the Lord their God, for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter in confession and worshiping the Lord their God. And so they heard the law of God and then they began to worship him uh, and for a quarter of the day, for six hours of that day, they began to confess their sins and cry out to God in repentance. Revival will involve a conviction of sinners and confession of sins. Number three, in true revival, Christians will have their faith renewed uh, that the lost will be saved. It's, it's a strengthening of our faith. It is renewed once again by our drawing close to God. You see, what happens is if we're not careful because of our spiritual sluggishness, our spiritual lethargy, we, f we, we are no longer gripped by the lostness of man. And we see people around us every day. They, they come and go to work. They, they, they walk through our classrooms. We, we see them every day in our lives. We run across our neighbors. And, and, and many of us know they do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. You know of a certainty uh, they are not born again. And yet our heart no longer grieves or worried about their eternal future. We're worried about getting by ourselves. And we become blind to the fact that people without the Lord Jesus Christ, when they die, they will go to hell. But we forget about that. We don't think about that. We just are surviving. And what happens in, in a genuine revival, God will begin to grip us with a great compassion for the lost. And we'll begin to cry out for the lost. And we'll begin to intercede for the lost. And we'll begin to lift them up to God through the arms of faith. And we'll begin to pray and seek his face. And we'll begin to tell everybody we see about the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a story in Mark chapter 8. I want you to turn there. It just kind of illustrates this second touch of God. Jesus Christ is going to heal somebody. And it's, it, his miracles are always different. They're always unusual. And this is no exception. There is a man that is blind. And look at what he does. And when he came to Bethsaida, verse 22, and some of the people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. And when he had spit on the man's eyes. Now, how, think about going out and praying for somebody that needs healing. Just, just get up a big loogie in your throat. <laughs> and 
And when he had spit on the man's eyes, he put his hands on him, and Jesus asked, do you see anything? Now, this is, this is really an unusual story. And he looked up, and he says, I see people. They look like trees walking around. In other words, he could see the images. He could see the people, but they were like trees. They were just, it was kind of all a blur. It wasn't clear. They couldn't see clearly. He could see. He had some sight. He just couldn't see clearly. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Now, what we do today, <coughs> excuse me, as children of God, is we see people as trees walking. We just see people out there, they're walking, they're doing their own thing. But when God touches us that second time, all of a sudden we'll begin to see very clearly they are lost without the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they need to know him. Uh, they need to be saved. Uh, they have an eternal soul. And my witness or lack thereof can determine where they're going to go and spend eternity. And we'll be gripped with the lostness of man. And I think that's what happens in that revival. There is that second touch of God that comes upon us and, and we begin to grieve and break and cry out for those who are still lost. And we carry them to the Lord in prayer. and We weep over them and we intercede for them. And we stand in the gap for them and we believe for their salvation and we don't let go until we see God save them. The fourth thing that happens in a revival, revival breaks the power of the world and sin over Christians. Brings them to such a vantage point they get a fresh glimpse of heaven and a fresh glimpse of God and so they get so close to God they don't care about this world anymore. They don't care about that pleasure anymore. They don't care about that sin they've been dabbling in anymore. They don't care about anything else that's been feeding their flesh anymore. They don't care about that because they're getting so close to Jesus Christ. Their desire is union with God and nothing else. The charm of this world is broken and the power of sin is overcome. Hallelujah. Don't have to come and repent every single day for something you did yesterday uh, because you're just loving Jesus and you're getting close to him and those things no longer have that hold on you and those chains are broken because you're in the presence of God and Christ is all that matters. 